Alternative Radio. You are listening to Texas History Lessons, a slow walk through Texas history made in Texas by a Texan for everyone everywhere. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to email the show at texashistorylessons at gmail.com. Welcome to Texas History Lessons. I'm Michael, and today is another special bonus episode. Near the beginning of when I started this podcast, a listener contacted me and recommended or just reminded me that it was an anniversary of the great Galveston hurricane. That is the worst disaster in terms of death toll in Texas history. Thousands and thousands of people died. That was a very hard episode to do because going and researching about how and reading the personal memories of what people experienced at that event and the devastation and the aftermath and how people came together afterwards to rebuild, that was very inspirational. And recently, a listener contacted me and said, hey, have you ever heard of the new London school disaster explosion? And this event is what we're going to be talking about today. We're, we're going to be looking at that, but we're going to be looking about the history of the area also in the lead up to what happened and why it happened and kind of play it by ear. And the gentleman that suggested it, he's here with me today. and I'm very excited. He's my first interview I've ever done. He has co- connections to the community that run very deep. He's very knowledgeable about the area and what happened and has a great interest in Texas history and some connections to some very interesting people uh, in Texas history. He has some connections to some very important people in the history of Texas. And so I want to introduce uh, Mr. Dean Vinson. Dean, thanks for joining me. You're welcome. So um, Russ County is in East Texas. It's about, what, 120 miles southeast of Dallas? Is that about right? Exactly, exactly. Uh, uh, from uh, uh, my county to Dallas, Texas, exactly 114 miles. Exactly. Okay. Okay. And what, what's the, some of the other counties in the area around Russ County? Uh, the ones that touch us is Gray County, uh, Smith County, Upshur County, and Cherokee County are the ones that touch us. We're actually the biggest county in this area. Okay. Now it's the, 939 square miles. Now, the... the uh, Russ County, that, that area originally would have been home to the Caddo Indians. Some Spanish explorers I know did go through that area. They encountered them there. They had there was a some band still living there. I think in the 1700s, the Tejas. They call them the Tejas. This is where we get the name Texas from. They lived there, and then Russ County was originally part of one of the original counties of Texas when Texas became a republic. It was part of Nacogdoches County. Yes, sir. And in 1843, the Republic of Texas created Russ County out of that. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, we are named after Thomas Jefferson, Jefferson Rusk, which, who fought at the, at the Battle of San Jacinto. Battle of San Jacinto. He has Jacinto. a lot of connection to the Texas Revolution. Yep, and he was Secretary of War during the Republic. He was head of the Republic Ar- the Army for the, the nation of Texas at one yeah. point. Well, he's not buried in Russ County. He's actually buried in Nacogdoches County. Oh, he's Nacogdoches. buried in Nacogdoches County. Okay. And you've been to his grave. We're going to talk about, you visit a lot of historic graves, and you document this on your YouTube channel, and we're going to talk about that near the end of the episode to, so people can kind of go see what you do and show the historic things that you visit. Um, so originally not many people really lived in that area from what I understand, and about the 18, 18, 19, 18, 20, and then after that, the Cherokee Indians and some of the other immigrant tribes from the eastern United States, uh, we all know the story about the Trail of Tears and how they were forced from their lands. And a lot of them ended up here in Texas. And Sam Houston knew a lot of them. He uh, he knew the Chief Bowles or the Bowl that originally settled there with his people. And then there was... A, a treaty in 1836 that gave part of Russ County to the Cherokee. But then, you know, the early history of Texas, the Anglo settlers, they had a lot of distrust. They wanted that land and 
there was a there was a war with the Cherokee that basically forced them out about 1839. Yes. And then, now you tell me about this because I, I know you'll know about this. So fast forward a couple of more years, 1843, Russ County is created out of Nacogdoches County, and then. 1844 and 1845, some, a lot of Cherokees apparently returned and bought land called uh, about 10,000 acres from a white man who was married to a Cherokee, the Mount Tabor Indian community. Yes. You, you visit, have you seen that? What, what's the situation there with that area now? Are there still com- Cherokees that live there? Is that, that's... There are still some live there, but not many. Uh, the county itself, I mean, the area itself is, is followed up. I forgot what it is, but it's followed up by another town that there's a marker there telling you about it. I haven't been there yet myself, but okay. I will go there. And this was in the western part of the county. I think. Yes. And, and if, correct me, it's New, New London, from what I can tell, it was also in the western part of the county. Yes, sir. So about, what, when was that? About um, 1855, there was, a post office was set there to serve the area, and it was called London. Yes, sir. And for a, the longest time, it was just an agricultural area, and basically had lots of plantations. Russ County was also, in 1850, the second most populated county in the state of Texas. And they had lots of plantations and lots of farms there. Yes, sir, but there's not many of the plantations left anymore. I mean, there's still a few of the plantation houses, but there's not none of them are really marked or anything. They're right. still sitting there. Right. Fast forwarding quite a bit more. So Russ County was mostly agricultural. Um, they grew, I'm sure, cotton and corn and wheat and all the other kinds of crops. In 1930, a guy, Dad Joyner, drilled and basically discovered the East Texas oil field that became, it became a huge boom. And this was in the middle of the Great Depression when most of the country, most people were struggling just to get by. But the oil boom brought lots of money to the area. And a lot of people were able to thrive in a time when other people in the, in the country weren't able to. At the, about the same time, it was in 1931, the name was changed to New London because there was already another town with London that had a post office, something like that. So, what I understand. Yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, the, the well you're talking about, it, we call it, it's called Discovery Well. Um, Dad Joyner actually partnered with my great uncle, uh, H.L. Hunt. H.L. stands for Henry Lafayette Hunt. Right. So you, you have a connection to that through the Hunt yes, family. Sir. That's pretty impressive. My uncle is the one that started the Hunt Oil Company. Right, right. A lot of people have probably heard about that. That's I actually a, the, grew up, uh, where I grew up at is actually right at uh, two and a half miles from where the well was drilled at. And really? it's still uh, working well today. They're still pumping oil out of it today. Still are. After, from 19, the 1930s on, it's still going. That's, that's yes, pretty, sir. that's quite something. Well, from what I understand, oil wells just started getting popped up everywhere in the county. Farmers were letting their fields go bad because they were so busy trying to work out deals with the oil companies to try to make the most money they could off of it. Lots of money poured into the community. And one of the highlights for the community of New London, they built this massive, beautiful school. Could you describe the school? I know on one of the videos you in, in New London, there's actually a museum that shows yes, a, a replica of the school. Could you describe the building? The best way to describe it is it was built in a U shape. Uh-huh. Uh, the um, back then, the way it was set up is if you're standing on Highway 42 in front of the school, to the right of the building was nothing but the high school side of it on the on that wing, and on the left wing was uh, nothing but the high school. It's junior high and high school on one building. Really? Yeah. So it, it was like a junior high and a high school combined. Yes, sir. And they had, a, I mean, right now, if I understand, from the seventies on, New London's population has only been anywhere from eight hundred to about a thousand. Yes. Is that correct? But at that yes, time, sir. they had, their school had about, was it over 800 students? Is that right? Back then, uh, we'd come and go because people would come, make their fortune they wanted to, and the old building just up and leave. Right. Okay. So it varied, but they had a yes, lot sir. of students, though. Well, at the, at the time, it was the, uh, 
the uh the discover well that they discovered is uh is actually part of a well that stretches from New London all the way up to uh Longview. It's forty miles long and twelve miles wide. Really? Yes, sir. But this was would have been a state of the art school for anywhere pretty much. Yes, but they did cut some corners in the build in the building of it. And one of those corners they ended up cutting in January of nineteen thirty seven they had they they uh, help me here the school board made a decision to rather than pay for the natural gas they tapped it can you explain what happened they tapped into a well yes sir uh what it was is they drilled a hole looking for oil and they found natural gas and back then you know nowadays we know that nat- you know uh, natural gas has a lot of uses back then they just saw natural gas as a waste product as a throwaway product yes so the guy that owned the well that they drilled into offered them to go ahead and tap into that well so they could get it for free instead of having to pay for the natural gas since it was known as a waste product. You know, he didn't know, you know, he, they saw no profit in it. And so something went wrong when they made the switch and the school had a large crawl space under it, about 250 feet by 50 feet. Is that something in the area? Yes, sir. And what happened in from what I've understood, and there's lots of great articles. Texas Monthly has a great article where they actually went back and found a lot of the residents. Heck, maybe one of your uh, relatives might have even been quoted. I don't. I'm not sure in the article. They are. They are. Okay. And uh, we'll we'll get to some of those memories here. What happened was there was for the 19th there was going to be a big interscholastic meet in another town, right? Yes. And students were let off for the day for Friday. But on Thursday, it was just school as usual. And the PTA was meeting. And normally the PTA would have met in the auditorium. But they some of the younger kids were doing a dance or something for them. So they moved it to the gymnasium. Is that right? Yes, sir. At the time of the explosion, they were doing the uh, Mexican hat dance, mm-hmm. actually. Mm-hmm. School day is coming to an end. And... Do you want to explain the lead up to what happened? Well, it involved the shop well, teacher back, or a manual back arts teacher? Back up a little bit. Yeah. Uh, the day before the end, you know, because back then, that's where guys didn't have this mill. Right. The day before the explosion, there was a lot of kids that were sent home or complaining of headaches and nausea and nobody knew why. They didn't know that there was a leak building because they'd been leaked for, I don't know how long it had been leaking for. Nobody really knows. But, right. Uh, yeah, it had been leaking, so they were having students complain of nausea and headaches and all that. Yeah. Well, the day of the explosion, uh, the shop teacher went down to the uh, basement, what you call it, the crawl space. It's actually a basement they use with classrooms and all that. Uh-huh. And uh, turned on an electric sander. And when that, when he turned on the electric sander, it ignited the pocket of gas. Yes. And that was exactly 3.15 when the school exploded. What happened is uh, my great-granddad, on, I mean, no, it wasn't my great-granddad, it was my granddad on my dad's side. Uh, we were, the house I grew up in was exactly two miles from the school. Okay. okay. He said when it exploded, he felt the ground sick and he took no, he took, he thought nothing of it because there's always oil fields exploding in here. Yeah. Well, he said, you know, keep in mind, it's two miles away. He said he saw bricks raining down into the, into our yard. Oh gosh. So he took off running to the school and they said that he stayed there for three days without coming home. And uh, when the building exploded, what happened was instead of it exploding out, what it did is it blew the roof up and it came back down and, and collapsed, uh, collapsed on top of itself. Good God. And the devastation was terrible. Well, when you do research, you'll find, I don't know how many different numbers of how many died. We mm-hmm. tr- in all honesty, we truly do not know how many died in there because there's, you know, like I said, there's so many families that would come and go. So there's so many that were undocumented in the area at the time. Right. I remember, and you showed in your video, the newspapers, some of the newspapers were saying up to 700 or 800 students and faculty the, had been killed. The, the last count that I know of, the last official count that I know of right now is 1,500. Wow. Some sources say, it's like because you said, there's no, they wouldn't be able to know. A lot of the, a lot of the different things I've come across say at least 295 or so died and they don't have an exact and they don't have an exact number for the Galveston hurricane either because so many yeah. people were never found and you know we we, well, we just don't know when it comes to New London um 
there's an area not too far from there, the Blessing Hill Cemetery. Mm-hmm. Uh, that one, the day after the, they, well, not the day after, I remember when, but they said that in one day, there was 150 funerals in one day in that cemetery. Wow. But there's a spot where we're trying to put a marker on it because there's a mass grave out there. I know this might sound a little graphic for your listeners, but no. there's a mark, unmarked grave of mass grave of like arms and legs. So they couldn't identify, identify or match to a body. So they just throw them all in a mass grave out there and bury it. That's why we don't know the exact number. The, in fact, some of the, some of the parents could only identify their kids because of the shoes they had on that day. Oh my God. And there's another report I, I've read, um, uh, of a mother that found her daughter that had been blown to bits, they say, and she died of a heart attack right there on scene when she found her daughter. I, I my couldn't grand, even My imagine. granddad was there to witness that one. Oh, he he did witness that. So the explosion happens, and the one large that one report I was looking at said there was this huge block that weighed several a ton at least. Two tons. Two tons, and it was blown how far, and it landed on a car? 250 yards on top of a car. Now, when I was a kid, there was a rumor that there was a teenager in the car at the time. That is not, if anyone hears that, that is not true. There's nobody in the car at the time, but there is rumors that there was a teacher in the car that got crushed, but that's okay. not true. <laughs> I yeah. want to clear that up. <laughs> okay, okay. The sound of the explosion was so loud, it was heard at least four miles away. It was heard over into the next county. Yeah, yeah. And it shook, uh, it shook the ground up to four miles away, but it was heard several counties over. In fact, uh, my, uh, my other granddad on my mom's side, yeah. he was at another school back then. You may have heard about this one called the Gaston School at the time. Okay. Over in Jornerville, Texas, they were building a rock wall in front of the school. They heard the explosion and they didn't even think nothing of it. They just quit what they were doing and started heading toward it. In uh, Overton, Texas, which is exactly uh, about, well, not exactly, it's about 10 to 12 miles away from New London. Okay. This will be a fam- another famous name connected to the explosion. There was a 26-year-old reporter in there doing a story, and the reporter's name was Walter Cronkite. Walter Cronkite, yes. He saw. He said that he was doing a report, and he saw a huge dust cloud. So he didn't know. He, he quit what he was doing there because he figured he, this might be more interesting than what I'm doing, not realizing what he's about to drive up onto. So Walter Cronkite, who, if you haven't heard of him, you haven't heard of anybody in uh, the history of American media. He's one of the you, you've been hiding under a rock, I say. <laughs> most famous uh, newsmen in American history. He kind of set the standard of for the. Uh, for the newsman and he and that's one of the interesting things i didn't know i didn't know he was working here in texas at that time and this was been, yeah. been at the very beginning of his career in the 1930s yes. at the yes. new at the london museum there's actually a recording of him an interview with him years later describing it so I that kind of say something about that no, go <laughs> ahead yeah go ahead there is a recording, there is several, uh, you saw the one in the video, I had to edit out the other one out because of copyright reasons. Okay. Uh, because there's one you didn't see what it is, is there's one you saw, that there's a thing on the wall, you hit a button, you hear his interview, but also in the museum, there's a area where you can go and play the video mm-hmm. interview of him, but I had to cut that out of the video on YouTube because of copyright reasons, because of the media and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's... But they have the, they have the voice recording and the, uh, video recording and Walter Cronkite on the day he retired they were asking about it he said even after covering all the wars and all that the New London School Explosions was still in the back of his mind of one of the worst if not the worst story he ever had to cover and he kind of covered part of what happened in the immediate aftermath yes because after it happened word spread through phone and Western Union correct yes sir. and People from all over, oil field workers were showing up to help. And they were, and Cronkite describes how he gets there, parks the car, gets out, and he sees these oil field workers, tough guys, and they tear streaked faces. Their hands are bleeding from trying to, through the rubble, to try, and they were passing bodies out and doing everything they could to dig. The oil field companies sent, they brought in these big lights to put lights up it had to have been one of the most unbelievable horrifying scenes for a community another thing, another thing to add to the scene only did you have all that going on them digging with their bare hands and all that that night it started raining on them to add to the scene oh gosh 
Yeah, so you know to add to add to the aftermath and all that, it had rain only uh, after the uh, building exploded. There's only one section left standing. Yeah, there's very. And then there wasn't. It wasn't even that big from the picture. It doesn't even look that consequential to the size of the whole school. It uh, would be the equivalent to a plantation house. It was left standing to give people a reference on size. One of the um, memories shared in the Texas Monthly article. One of the people was said he was actually in the class with um, what was his name the, the 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 teacher Lemmy R Butler and he'd been repairing a sander and he igni- he at three o five he tested it and that's what lit the gas. One of the students said he was there in the shop class on the first floor with about thirty other boys. It was getting close to quitting time, and I was doing some welding in the front of the room when Lemmy Butler, the teacher, pulled on on an electrical switch to get the machine to work. He said, the next thing I knew, I was picking myself up outside the building. He didn't remember flying out the window, but when he came to his senses, the building was still coming down. Yes. And another, um, that and that person's name was W.G. Bud Watson. He was an eighth grader at that time. Yes. Then there's Robert Hatfield, who was in fifth grade, and he didn't want to go to school at all that day. Yeah. And asked his mom, if can I stay home? She said no. He left school early that day anyhow, and she met him in the yard. They were about 10 feet apart. And I can imagine a mother who said, do not come home. Yes. And she's probably about to, he's probably about to get a whooping or something like that for disobeying the mother. And I bet the mother never regretted him coming home because... Right when they were having their little confrontation, that's when the school blew up. Yes. And, you know, a lot of, <laughs> she probably, she probably was very happy that he had disobeyed her. Um, because all these, all these students died, teachers died. And, um, a lesser known story. Yeah. So there's a guy there, his last name is Dorsey, and there's a girl that had a crust on in the classroom. Uh huh. And he asked the person in front of him if they could switch seats. So she, she did, she let him switch seats so he could switch closer to the girl that he had a crush on. And when the school exploded, he survived, and the one he switched seats with did not. Oh, no. There'd be a feeling of relief and guilt at the same time, I'm yeah. sure. And there's, a, there's another known, a lesser known story of uh, you know, one of uh, one of the people was driving to the school, and they saw this kid, uh, they would start naked running down the road. Oh, good God. And uh, she stopped to try and contact him and to talk to him, and he just kept running with a blank stare. Well, later on that day, she saw that same boy with his Boy Scout uniform on up there helping clean up. Really? Because they called in the local Boy Scouts. They called in the National Guard. People from all over came to, to, to help support and, and help. In fact, in Tyler, Texas, there's a place called Mother Francis, well, it's Christian Mother Francis Hospital now. Yes. They were supposed to open March 19th. Yes. But they opened up March 18th, a day early, because of the school explosion. And in the, fact, if you go to the uh, go into the main entrance of the hospital and take an immediate left into the hallway right there, they have a plaque commemorating it in there. It's just, it's just hard to imagine living in an area and that happening. Um, in this area, we call it the day a generation died uh, because there's an oil field worker that uh, he said that morning it was him, it was his three kids and his wife. Yeah. Well, at the end of the day, it was only him because his wife got called to the school because of one of the kids acting up. Mm-hmm. And she was there when it exploded, so by the end of the day, it was only him left in the family. That uh, See, I don't know how many people know about this, and I'm glad you brought this this subject up because it must have affected the area the memory of everybody in the area for a long time do they do they have memorials for that in years afterwards every, every year of the anniversary they do they have a memorial at the uh, memorial uh, that was built out there in front of the school okay and there but, are people like you you don't live in New London right now, but you grew up there. You went to school yes, in sir. New London. Your family has connections. Your your grandfather your grandfather was there. Do you want to share some stories that he told you? Well, I I didn't get to meet him because he passed away in 1971. The oh, okay. stories I had was passed down for the family. Right. Uh, but they said that he ran he ran the two miles to the school 
and he stayed up. He didn't come home. Uh, my grandma said he didn't come home for three days, and they pulled the last body out on the third day. After that, it was just pieces coming out. Good Lord. In fact, he was up there helping identify some of the victims because, you know, you know, it's just in the continent community that basically everybody knows everybody. One source says, I did not ever see the mention about the mass grave with because of the horrific nature of just finding body parts. But for the ones they could identify, everybody did have a casket and a funeral. Yes. Were, were they mostly, Is it? I can't remember the name of the cemetery. Was there one cemetery in particular that most of them were buried at? Pleasant Grove or something like that? Pleasant, Is that Pleasant Hill Cemetery. Pleasant most Hill Cemetery. Were, most of them were buried in Pleasant Hill Cemetery just outside of New London. And a lot, a lot, uh, some more of them are buried in a place called Mount Hope Cemetery, which is over closer to Henderson. Okay. But some of the families did have them. Like, I know of one family that had the body shipped back to Oklahoma because yeah. that's where they moved to after the explosion. Right, right. They're buried all over the place. In fact, there's several I know of that's buried in the Dallas area, too. Okay. Not only is this the third worst disaster that Texas ever suffered, it's the worst school disaster in the entire history of the United States. Yeah, the only two things in Texas that caused the more death is the uh, Galveston hurricane and the Texas City explosion. Right, the Texas City explosion. Galveston was the worst by thousands. That one was just ridiculous. And then the Texas City thing, um, which we'll take a look at someday. I don't know. I mean, so you grew up, you grew up just hearing probably stories about this I mean, it was something you probably had already always knew about. Yes, sir. Well, and, part of the reason why it's not very known is because the way a lot of people dealt with it yeah. is for forty is for forty years. Uh, most of the families just didn't even talk about it. Right. Nobody brought it up. Right. That's just that's just how they dealt with it. They just didn't talk about it. Because how do you talk about the, such a loss? Of, like you said, an yes, entire sir. generation. And some of the people were transient people that were families that had come in to make money, but other families had been there probably, your family has been there for generations. Um, uh, my, I, my family, uh, uh, ourselves lost uh, three cousins. Wow. Afterwards, there was a lot of outrage. There was investigations done. People were furious about this. Lawsuits were brought up. But from what I understand, most of the lawsuits were just dismissed. And nobody got any compensation. Not that there could have been any compensation for the loss of all, all lawsuits were dropped because they decided that there's nobody, not one person or one company to blame for it. Right. Okay. In fact, uh, where the school is built now, the new high school building. Yeah. The front of that building would butt up against the building that was there. In fact, uh, this is another piece of history some people would know. There's a lot of people that kind of didn't want to put their kids back in school because two yeah two years ago they uh well now the now the building is all central air and heat yes but before they did that last year two years ago they happened to hook back up to that same well that they exploded the school really yes sir it's, it's just hard to imagine there the, the and the the oil was just booming everywhere even on a uh, school property, I I saw that there were even oil wells. That's why it was so convenient, I guess. There's still wells on the school property today. And after the explosion, um, if you, if anybody goes to the school, um, when you look behind the school, there's an area that has a baseball field and the and the practice football field. Underneath that field is where the original building is buried at. They put they all they did was dig a massive hole, push it down on the hill, and bury it all right there on campus. Of course, there's a lot of hauntings and ghost stories that go on behind it, too. <laughs> well, I'm sure, I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are. I, I can imagine. Uh, is there anything else that I haven't brought up that you want to cover, especially particularly about, because I wanted to ask you some other questions about some other of your interests in Texas history, but about this this event that you would like to share? Uh, yeah, uh, something that's not on record, but you can find out about it whenever you go to the uh Explosion area. Um, I mean, to the museum is uh, the uh, the, the uh, Texas Ranger that helped with Bonnie and Clyde. Actually, helped with some of the cleanup in the area too. He showed up on scene for a little while because he was Bonnie and Clyde happened to be in that area at the time too. Which is interesting because you're related to Bonnie. Bonnie, 
through how are you? How's how's that through family my, connection? Uh, my, through my dad's side of the family, she's a cousin to me. Uh, well, actually, the interesting piece of it is, is this. Okay, on my dad's side of the family, she is a, a cousin. Uh huh. But on my mom's side of the family, I have an aunt that let uh, Bonnie and Clyde use her house to hide out and made dresses for Bonnie. Really? Now I'm going to take this opportunity to take a short break and thank Age of Radio for hosting Texas History Lessons, and we'll be right back. And then another person you're related to is, we brought his name up earlier, Sam Houston, which, you know, growing up, loving Texas history, he was one of my heroes growing up. He's one of the, I would follow story, read stories. I still, I still have, actually, I had to go get a, buy a new copy of one of the first books I read when I was real little was a book about Sam Houston growing up and living with the Cherokee and then coming to Texas. And of course, that was a kid's book. And then learning more stuff about him later on, about things about his life. You travel around quite a bit and you like to document places you visit. You have a YouTube channel that you can, if you want to share the, the name of it. And I'll, if you, you send me the link, I can send you, I can show the, put, try to put the link to the, in the show notes regarding it's, the uh, uh, museum. It's called Dude Vlogs and Travels. Dude Vlogs and Travels. You visit all kinds of historic uh, cemeteries, historic sites. One of the most interesting ones. Tell, talk a little bit about, if you will, the the international boundary that you have a video of. Uh, yeah, that's just outside of it. Uh, the closest town that I know of in the area is called Carthage, Texas. It's 11 miles east of that, down you know, uh, Farm Market Road 31. Uh, right across the border from it is Logan's Port, Louisiana, so that way people can get a better idea of where it's located at. Uh-huh. Um, it is the last known because there could be more out there, is the last known boundary marker for when Texas was a republic. Some of them they know of further south has fallen into the Sabine River. But where that one is, is a dry land crossing. There's no river nothing up there. Describe what it looks like, because I couldn't quite make out what was written on it in the video. It was, it's a, con, it's made out of concrete. I'm not sure how they did that back to the end, but it was, says it was placed there originally uh, April, I don't remember the exact day, but it was April of 18... Oh, dang, I can't remember the date right now. <laughs> no, that's all right. I'm, I'm um, blank on it right now. People can go look at your video and see it. It's, it was in the 1840s, though. Wasn't yeah, 18. It? I think it's 1841 or 42. One of them two. It's April of 1842. Is the place I'm still wondering. Like to me, back then, it's so amazing that they did it made out of concrete. I was just wondering how they did that back then. That's that's true. Maybe somebody listening can can write the show or um, let us know about that. Because that is curious. And it's just, uh, there, then it's the only one that we know of. It's the only one in yes, the sir. United States that's a marker like that because Texas was its own republic at the time. So it's an international boundary marker within the borders of the United States, which is yes. pretty remarkable. Uh, um, where that marker sits right now, the modern day uh, state line is 10 feet behind it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I encourage people to go check that video out. It's uh, because you, you show it, you you walk the ground there and show what happens. Um, On my for the ones that go to my channel, the video is called "A Fun Piece of Texas History." Right. For people that really love uh, music in Texas history, um, not too far from that marker, if you go back up thirty one into Carthage, mm-hmm. then you get on fifty nine, go north until you see seventy nine. When you see 79, take your right back toward Louisiana. Go exactly three miles out on your right out there. I have the video. My, one of my newest videos is this, too. Out there on your right, you'll find the grave of Jim Reeves. Oh, really? Yes, sir. He, he's buried in Carthage. Buried in Carthage. Carthage is also Texas. home to the Texas Country Music Hall of Fame. I've never been there. I'm going to have to hit that up. That's, I bet it's... And I know you have it's been awesome. there. It's awesome. It, it, huh? It's awesome. But like, it's hard to do a YouTube video in there because they have copyrighted music playing in there. But uh, Jim Reeves, when you go there, you'll see him, his wife, and his beloved dog buried out there. After his, uh, after Jim Reeves' dog died, they buried him out there with him. Is that and right? His wife passed. They buried her out there with him too. And Sam Houston, you, he's a great, great, great grandfather of yours on yes, sir. your mother's side. Yes, sir. On my mother's side. Are there any stories that were passed down about him? 
that you well, know the of? The stories that I know of, that I've heard of here, is he, uh, he intermingled with my dad's side of the family. In fact, he asked, since we were talking about the school schools, and he has connections to New London because he intermingled with my dad's side of the family. He went to family gatherings over there uh, and in New London on the property I grew up on. That's pretty impressive. I actually went to this year to the Sam Houston and down at, down at Sam Houston state university, you can go visit and it's an amazing place. Cause it has a steamboat house that he died in and it has yes. another house that he lived in. Um, it's got his law office. Um, it's just a beautiful, really well taken care of exhibit. And you can really, there's something about visiting and you have visited lots of places across the country. You have videos all across the country that you visited historic sites there's something special about when you go to a place that has an actual connection to because you made his family like that and put yourself where they were at. Yeah, the way people lived. I mean, <laughs> no insulation in those walls, and you know, no, none. And they they survived. They are a lot tougher than we are now. And and you can't. And the way the house is built, you know, with modern day society, you can't walk into a room and just flip this switch to turn a light on. Mm-mm, mm-mm. It really yeah, puts you there. Also, also, I haven't been there yet, but I'm going to soon. But I also have a video on my channel of Sam Houston's break. I've been there too. Yeah, I have not visited that. I want to visit that. Um, of course, there's the famous statue down on. Is, is it a 45? Yes, sir. It's on 45, uh, just south of Huntsville. I've been there too. I didn't. I, I, I don't know why, but when I went to visit, it, I didn't think to pull my camera out and record. But I just, you know, just visiting, you know, the statue of my great great granddad. <laughs> yeah. I wish I could remember the name of the sculptor that did that. He's he's pretty famous. He lives down in the Houston area. I think he's still alive. Um, there's a show uh, called Texas Bucket is List. Is he the same one that did the Stephen F. Austin one down in Angleton? I'm not sure if he did okay. or not. He's he had, he's he's kind of famous because he he's pretty much done giant sculptures of busts of I, he's done almost every president. Um, yes. These giant statue just like the steve and and the steve, the i'm sorry the sam houston one i think that's one of the largest statues there is of a person yes sir and you know it's, it's just kind of some people say it's, it's too much but um it, it's something to all because whenever oh. we drive down that we'd like to go visit galveston quite a bit and it's always on our way down there and we always enjoy just seeing that because we know we're getting close yeah well, if you if you go visit the one of Sam of Stephen F. Austin down in Angleton, Texas, it's uh, if you the way you get there is you go from Houston, you go straight down two eighty eight, and you'll finally you'll see it just south of Angleton there. That one looks bigger than Sam. I mean, it's smaller, but it looks bigger than Sam Houston because they have it built up on a higher pedestal. Sam Houston, Nate looks like he's standing there with his feet on the ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, before we started uh, recording. I was talking about the another place to see some really impressive statues and memorials to famous Texans is in Austin, the state cemetery, which is just east of the capital. It's a cemetery, but it's it's a nice place to visit because you just feel steeped in history. What are some of the favorite places you've visited that are history related in Texas and uh-huh. elsewhere? Well, the, uh, of course, the uh, historical marker there, the international border. And uh, because of the history behind it, I thought it was kind of cool when I finally, uh, for, this is going to be off subject of some of the other stuff we've been talking about, another subject you might cover one day, uh, is when I went to uh, cover the, uh, David Koresh's grave, uh, the guy from Waco. I didn't know he was his grave was so close to where I live at. Mm-hmm. I um, also loved it when I went. One of my all-time favorite places I ever visited, though, was, well, two of them was Gettysburg, of course, and Appomattox, where the surrender happened, because I have a great, great, because uh, I forgot to tell you about this. Uh, the main reason why I was so happy to go to Appomattox is because on my dad's side of the family, my great, 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 great granddad is uh, Robert E. Lee. Is that right? I'm it- also related to Wordsworth Wilson. <laughs> so your family is just... <laughs> It's almost it. <laughs> it's almost unbelievable how many family connections you've got. It's and, and to and, you know and to stand and to stand there because you can't sit down in it because it's a historical piece. But to stand and look at the desk where your great 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 granddad sat, you know, during the surrender of the Civil War was just right. awesome to be there. That's some, that's something else. That's yeah. hard. As far as Texas history, it's pretty cool seeing, um, because, you know, we're Sam Houston's period. Uh, he's not the only historical figure. There's several U.S. Uh, Texas congressmen. 
and uh, a Texas governor that's buried in the same cemetery he's buried in, too. Okay. Down in Huntsville, Texas. There's also a place in Tyler that uh, you, uh, Texas governor, buried at. I thought that was a pretty cool place to visit at, too. Well, yeah, yeah. Earlier this year, we visited Springfield, Illinois, and got to visit. And this is right before the shutdown, where yeah. you could had to stop going anywhere, and it, it was right at the very beginning. And we got to visit Abraham Lincoln's house in Springfield, and go through it. Go there and to see his grave. You need both are worth the trip just for that, because. They have not only his house, they have some other houses preserved. It's like they still have it set up like it would have been set up yes, sir. in the neighborhood. And you can go through his house and you can see the stove that he bought his wife. You can see all these personal belongings. You can see where he had the na- nail put nails in the fireplace mantle for the stockings at Christmas time. Um, you can see, and they're tiny rooms, and you can see, I mean, he was a very tall man. And you could see, because one of his favorite things to do is read, of course, and he you could see one of the guys point out, said he would just lay there on the floor in the living room yeah. reading a book, and you see uh, his personal desk. And, yeah, I encourage everybody to do that and visit the places you've talked about. Um, up there in the same area, when you're going towards there, if you go through St. Louis, east of the r- St. Louis, across the river, is a place called Cahokia. Yes. And I've mentioned I've that in an earlier episode. That's amazing. It's almost... Uh, a, if I remember right, that's not too far from uh, Wilson's Creek, too. Well, I'm not sure, but it, I believe you, if that's if that's true. It, it is. Uh, Wilson, it's up there close to Wilson's Creek, and Wilson's Creek is in, is a forgotten uh, part of history, too. It's actually one of the first major engagements of the Civil War. Right. I know the name sounded familiar, so and, that's something else you can visit. Yeah, another... Another one of my favorite places, you didn't mention Missouri. Another one of my favorite places I got to visit was up there in Missouri. Somewhere, I don't remember the exact name of the town. I thought it was Coastal Springfield. Um, it's where Laura Inglis Water lived at, the one that did the books for Little House on the Prairie. Yeah, yeah. Lincoln's, where he's buried, is a very special, amazing monument. Yeah, I thought it was pretty tall. It's very tall. It's just, it's just, it's just amazing visiting places like that. So, have you always been interested in history? Is it something like... Always. From the time you were a kid? Yes, sir. I've always been interested in history and learning. Like, you know, it started, my love of history uh, started off with me just researching my family history, right. where my heritage came from. Right. Because my family originally started off in Scotland. Mm hmm. Same here. A lot yeah. of my connections in My little family name is Gunn, spelled G U N N. Mm hmm. I don't know exactly when we came to the United States, so I can figure that out yet. <laughs> well, Mom's side of the family is hard to, hard to uh, uh, figure out, though, because my granddad was adopted uh, when he was born. They, uh, they didn't really keep, you know, records like we do nowadays. Right. Yeah, a lot of people would just bring a child in that's either a neighbor's kid or a, a relative's kid and raise them as a member of the family, and they'd just be another child, that a brother or sister well, almost. <clears throat> what happened to him is uh, he was raised by his grandma because his dad was an uh, electrician. He was killed by... Uh, electric pole falling in him when he was younger than his mom got sent to prison for the rest of her life or something. I don't know mm-hmm. what the charge was once he got sent to prison. Yeah. And uh, he was raised by his grandma in a place called Hemphill, Texas. Mm-hmm. Which actually has some history uh, behind it with the uh, revolution and everything that some people don't know about. Yeah. Well, man, we are approaching almost an hour. Okay. It's been absolutely wonderful talking to you and digging into the story of the New London school disaster even though it's a horrible thing to go back and look it's, at it's something that needs to be remembered it needs to be remembered and that's and like you said it's the reason why you smell gas if there's a gas leak in your house and you know there's something wrong it's because of that because yes. in the aftermath texas passed they were the first i believe to pass a law yes. mean making them put i don't remember the name of the chemical or material that's added but they were the first, and then it, of course, rapidly spread across the United States. And there's another interesting, odd, but interesting thing you brought up to me. And you show it in, it's a replica of the original telegram. But in 1937, there was a certain despicable leader in Germany that had uh, yes, not sir. quite yet hit the worst of his stride. But he actually sent his condolences. Yes, sir. Hitler did. 
He sent his condolences. Their, uh, yeah, their Western Union Telegraph. Yeah, in fact, they have a copy of it, and the um, the original telegram used to be there. Yeah, uh, but it has been. They have a copy of it now because the original one is actually uh, being sent to uh, the Smithsonian right now. Oh, is that the case? Okay. And the, the interesting thing about that that show and the fact that so many people probably have not heard about this event. That's how big this event was. It yes. shocked people around the world, and it was so horrific. And it, you know, being a being a father, or even if you're not a father or a mother, just never having kids in your family, the idea of them going to school and then, like you said, an entire generation not coming home at night that night w- would have been. It's just one of those horrible, horrible things that need to be remembered. Is there anything else you want to share before we close out the episode? Oh, uh, since we're talking about them, um, something else a lot of people don't know about with Bonnie Clyde. One of their first robberies was a gas station in a little town called Arp, Texas. That's actually one of the first, if not the first robbery they ever did. What was the name of the town again? What was the name of the town again? Arp. It's spelled A-R-P. A-R-P, A-R-P, okay. Arp, Texas. That's one thing about Texas is <laughs> there are some odd name places here. And there are lots of other places that, this is like the county I live in, Montague, Texas, County, Texas. It's Montague, but we call it Montague for some reason. And there's other... Well, speaking of, uh, of uh, weird name places, I have a friend that lives in a town called Cut and Shoot. Yeah, that's an odd name. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. you have I mean, you have those names out there that people mis mispronounce all the time, like humble. People pronounce it as humble. Yeah, but it's humble or, or Mejia. Yeah, know, a lot of people pronounce it Mexico, but it's actually we pronounce it Mejia. Mejia, yeah. What I, yeah. what I what I like to do to get people to laugh uh, for the, anyone from Texas, what I like to do is for someone that's not in Texas, give them a uh, you know see if they can pronounce the name Nacogdoches just by giving them the word. <laughs> I have a trouble with it. <laughs> I, I've always had trouble with certain names like that. Um, there's also, um, there's actually, um, and I don't remember, all you have to do is look up and go to YouTube and type in Texas names or something like that. Yeah. They're, the, the, what you're talking about, they, they've they done that with people, and it's like testing people to see how many of these names can you pronounce. It's like a, a Burnett, who is B-U-R-N-E-T, who was one of the early leaders of Texas who from what I recall, he hated Sam Houston. He did. But it's called, it's spelled Burnett, and most people oh. would say Burnett, but it's Burnett. Yeah, and another thing, too, uh, two more things real quick. You ever, have you ever heard of a town called Uncertain, Texas? Yes. That's, you know why it's named Uncertain? Been there. That's that's near Jefferson. It's near Caddo Lake, correct? It's actually on Caddo Lake. Yeah, it's right on. I've stayed uh, the there. I actually stayed the night there, yeah. Texas is because when it was founded, they were uncertain if it was inside Louisiana or Texas. Because it's right there on the on the line, right yeah. on the border. Yeah, that's another that's great place that, to visit. That's exactly how it got its name, is because it was uh, they were uncertain of where it was at. Yeah, and there's not much there. I mean, but you can also well, you like can New visit Laundry. it. Yeah, Laundry go ahead. New London, you have a donut shop, a laundry mat, two churches, a post office, the museum, the school, and that's it. That's the entire town. Yeah, yeah. That's the town I grew up in. That's the town you in grew fact, up in. In uh, fact, yeah. the house that I grew up in was built in 1926. Well, yeah. in 1945, um, they decided they, they had to redo the foundation on the house because the house started sinking in certain places, and they used some of the bricks from the school that flew into our yard on the foundation. That's crazy. All right, let's wrap this up, Dean. Everybody, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Dean, for not only suggesting this episode but joining me and making it a hundred times better than it would have been if i'd have just been doing my research and telling the story because you brought a personal connection to it and it means a lot and i encourage people to go check out your youtube channel say the name again dude vlogs and travels dude vlogs and travels you put out a lot of videos man Yeah. You got a lot I out there. More plan, I have more planned out for Texas and U.S. See, that's the main reason why I cover a lot of these the historical markers is not because it's history nobody knows about. They right. only know about the major events. They don't know about these small things around here. It's important. 
Yeah. It's important to show that stuff. And I appreciate it. I appreciate you joining me. Everybody listening, please, if you want to email any information you have about this, that I, and if you want me to share it with Dean, I will, about anything, about play, interesting places to visit. And t- what are your favorite places to visit in Texas and beyond? Um, any we places shared some. that you want us to check out, too. Exactly. Let us know, because there's lots of places. Um, I, Texas is so big, you can just spend your entire life just visiting important historic places places one of the places we also just recently visited dean enchanted rock have you ever been out there i love that place it's amazing to give your listeners an idea as to how big texas is yeah um i live in a place called at the time i was living in a place called tiger Mm -hmm. we were gonna go see a friend of mine in arizona yeah and uh we left our house at midnight yeah we did not leave texas until six o'clock the next afternoon yeah that's how that's give, how big it is. Give your listeners how big how big Texas is. Yeah. So email me at texashistorylessons at gmail dot com. I'm on Twitter at Texas History Lessons. I've been following some really interesting. It's uh we're recording this in the month of March because that's when this event happened on March eighteenth, nineteen thirty seven. It's also Texas Independence Month. Like yesterday is Texas Independence Day. Exactly. That we're recording this the day after that. This isn't going to be released until... I'm going to release it the week of the uh, event. But yeah, thanks everybody. Thanks, Dean. You're welcome. And before we go, one more thing that I need to remember. I want to salute and thank Texas History Lessons Spotlight artist Jared Flushy for sharing his music with me to share with... It's a big deal. I love it. He's a talented musician. If you haven't already done it, go listen to Fan the Flames on Spotify, give support to a very creative and very great musical artist. And he's also part now of a band called Giovanni and the Hired Guns. He's a guitarist for them now. So if you ever get a chance, if they're playing, go look them up. If they are in your area, do not miss out on the chance to watch them play. First of all, They've got Jared Flushy playing guitar, and that's a sight worth seeing. But second, Giovanni's voice is a gift from God. I saw him once as an opening act, and he blew me away. His songs are amazing, personal, and just powerful. And the voice, like I said... (laughs) <laughs> he's he's got a he's got a voice gifted from God. So thank you, Jared Flushy. Thank you for sharing the, your music. I hope people are listening to it. We're gonna end the show with a track from the self-titled Jared Flushy album from 2020. And the song is Trash Talk. And it's another example of the range he has as a songwriter. It is a song that's it's just a storytelling song, a fun storytelling song, kind of in the vein of James McMurtry's Choctaw Bingo, looking at the North Texas, South Oklahoma methamphetamine marijuana trade. And thanks again for everybody listening. Appreciate all of you. And adios. Take care of each other. There's an Oklahoma man who wants to kill me. And I bet it's over money that I owe. Hard to draw a fine line between what's right and wrong, but you still reap the seeds you sow. Yeah, it's probably some gambling debt from an underground poker ring. Yeah, people get offed all the time. You'd be surprised how that Red River's lined with greed. It's just trash talk. It's just trash talk. Teresa got a baby daddy out in Kingston And he don't know the kid is real And she been telling her old man the kid is his Knowing that ain't even the deal Well, Billy's got his mama's garage Filled with marijuana out in Marietta Sometimes he goes over to that chicken saw truck stop Sells as much as the cops to let him It's just trash talk Billy's mama got cattle, she sells at the 
Denzel, Martin, and Kingston. Sometimes they let Billy clean the stalls. Sometimes he fills the trailers up with pot, depending on if the trucker cares if he gets caught. Sometimes Teresa will ride up there with her old man. He's got a nice Peterbilt covered up with chrome. And one night she got to the cell barn a little bit early when she came to pick up her old man to go home. But that's just trash talk. Hearsay trash talk. Man, I appreciate the heck out of you. Um, that's the fun. I've, I've never done an interview, so I hope I did okay. I hope I didn't walk oh, you on did you great. too much. Um, I hope you got a chance to share everything you wanted to. Um, if you ever have I a did. suggestion. If you have any more questions for me, you know, go far away. Yeah. Uh, I can't think of anything right now, but if you ever have another subject that um, you're very interested in, maybe we can do this again sometime. Oh yeah, anytime you or anytime you have, uh, if you wanted to, we could partner up a little bit. If you have a subject you don't know much about, you think I might know more of, contact me anytime. We research it together. Heck yeah, that's good, man. Like because I, said, I have connections to that. I have a lot of family connection to the Civil War because of uh, everyone did, uh, in my family that served on both sides. Right, right. Yeah, I, I looked into that recently when I was doing the Confederate statue. Yeah. I looked at my family. And I was like, majority, I mean, there were hundreds in the Confederacy, of course. And then, of course, there were the ones that, there were a handful that fought for the North. Not many, but most of the ones that bore my last, my, my last name is Sparkman. Most of the ones that served for the Union, I'm guessing they were escaped slaves or had taken on the sparkman they had because they were in the united uh the, the colored infantry yeah and uh that was just a weird thing to um when i saw that i was like wow because you know well, nobody <laughs> wants to most people say well my family didn't support slavery or didn't do that but well yeah most a lot of families did well that's a misconception a lot of people have about Robert E. Lee, he didn't actually own any slaves. He had slaves on his property, but he treated them like people, and they were free to come and go as they wanted. Okay. Well, weren't they his wives? Yes. That's that. Yeah, so he personally didn't own them, yeah. Yeah, he didn't own them, but at the same time, they didn't treat them bad. They treated them like people, and they, and they were free to come and go as they pleased on his property. Okay. Same yeah. with Sam Houston. He treated his with dignity. He treated his like with dignity. There's a great story, and you know this one, I know, about how he was... Um, going down the street one day and this guy who was a gambler and a drunk, who he, he was trying to raise money to pay off a whiskey debt or something like that. He was just yeah. trying to sell this young boy and this boy was just, all he was doing was looking in this, like a candy store and saw candy in there and Houston b- bought the young man on the spot and took him inside and bought him some candy. And he became Sam Houston's right. You know, this. I don't know why I'm explaining. Yeah, because like he he's uh he's buried beside Sam Houston out there. He was his right hand man because yeah, you know he's actually and he's buried on his right hand side out there in the cemetery. Yeah, yeah, that's you know that's a and he, yeah he actually then he I think he even had a uh, he gave a, he wrote a memoir or somebody wrote it down and it, he had nothing but kind things to say about Sam Houston. Yeah, because um he did he treated him. Well, in one of the journals that we were able to rescue from Sam Houston that we have, um, there's someone that noted that when Sam Houston died, he died with a bottle of his favorite whiskey in his hand. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, he well, he loved to drink. The, he, then they call him the big drunk. Yeah, the yeah. Cherokees did. Um, he, well, well, some people put him as an abusive drunk. He wasn't abusive, but he was a drunk. There's no doubting that. Right. No, I would never heard of him being abusive. I just knew that he did have periods of time in his life when he... And then, of course, the big one was after his wife left him after getting married, and he just 
gave up on being governor of Tennessee and just went back to live with the Cherokees again. Yes. Um, maybe, maybe we'll do a, maybe when I get closer to the, the history of, um, uh, the like the, the the revolution and stuff. We'll do an episode on Sam Houston, and kind yeah. of just go through stories about his life because you know he, he could do he could be two or three episodes all by himself. Everything yes, from his could. young life and you know to how he stood up against uh, secession and even his son Temple Houston is an interesting story. Yeah, you know, um, lots of legends surrounding him, but uh. All right, man. In fact, he scolded uh, Travis. He got on to Travis when he found out he actually abandoned his wife and child. Exactly, yeah. I've See, I've never really respected Travis. Neither have I because of that. Yeah. Yeah, and he, and he, in fact, he just flat out disobeyed. Or, and Houston said, don't stay there. Yeah. There's no reason to stay there because you're going to die. Yeah, and, he was uh, trying to get that. People don't understand. People, people try to scold. Houston, but what Houston was is he's trying to get them out of the Alamo because he knew it was a defensive, you know, just a sitting duck right there. Yeah, yeah, and we see what happened. Yeah. And yeah, and if you, and, and, you know, that's something we talk about. We do because you know if you watch it, Sam Houston was a genius doing what he did, moving like he did. Yeah, yeah, trying to get closer to Louisiana. There were United States military forces there that if they got close enough, they might have even helped. I, there was some sus that he might have been trying for that. I mean... Well, a lot of it was, too, because he knew doing it like he did, it would cause the Mexican army to spread out and get lower on supplies. True. Yeah. Just keep going. You, you, you know the real story behind the Yellow Rose of Texas, the but, song? I've heard different versions. What's the one you're going to tell me? Well, the one that I know of that I've been told is the real one is it was written about a prostitute that they sent into the Camp 2 district of uh, Santa Ana. Yeah. And she I was from New Orleans. I don't know the same, when we, when we, when Sam Houston them caught him, he was actually caught as a private and nobody knew it was Santa Ana until they brought him back into camp and everyone started saluting him. Yeah. El Presidente, El Presidente. Yeah. yeah. I could probably talk to you for another hour, but I got to get back in there and check out my wife and kid and, uh, okay. stay in contact. Um, I appreciate this again. And, um, and, uh, we'll, I'll be putting this out in, uh, like I said, a couple of weeks.